light a candle, sing a song. Say that the shadows shall not cross. Make an oblation out of all you lost in the longest night. Gather friends, cast your hopes into the fire as it snows. Stare at God through the dark windows of the longest night. Have you heard that we're going to be saved by mushrooms? Well, not mushrooms exactly, but fungi. The, the slightly mad mycologists I've known tell stories about fungi eating the plastics, the plastics overwhelming our oceans, our planet. And I know many right now are dreaming of another kind of mushroom healing a, a panoply of mental health challenges or mushrooms providing a powerful source of nutrients for an overcrowded planet. 
And did you know that the largest living organism on our planet is a mushroom, a honey mushroom spanning over 2,000 acres in the Mahler National Forest in Oregon? Almost the entirety of this great entity is three feet underground. And the heads that we see popping up above ground simply tiny expressions of a vast underground connectedness. Oh, it's a metaphor for so many things. The places where we see only the tiny individual head as it emerges above the ground and so easily miss the vast interconnectedness it emerges from. But today I'm thinking about a more simple meaning. I'm thinking about the power of that which grows in the dark. The power of that which grows in the dark. The neo-pagan writer Tanaz Chubb talks about this solstice, this upcoming moment on December 21st. She says, we experience the shortest day and longest night of the year. The increased hours of darkness guide us to enter into the dark night of the soul. A time of retreat when we can go within and hear the subtler stirrings of our being. Sometimes it is only in the darkness that we can truly feel comfortable to be ourselves, she writes. When the spotlight of the sun shines down on us, we can feel exposed. We can feel that we have to act or be a certain way. When the lights are turned off, when it is just us alone with our thoughts at midnight, that is where we can truly dive deep into our core, come face to face with a new truth of who we are. At this time, it's an opportunity for us all to enter into the darkness, to move away from the spotlight, instead to sit with ourselves and our truth in the darkness. Mm -hmm. She writes, our thoughts don't matter. It's our feelings that can truly shine. It's our emotional voice that gets a chance to speak. And we have to allow it to be heard. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it takes me quite a while sitting in the stillness and the silence of the dark before I can really hear that emotional voice, that still small voice of the soul of spirit. So in this season of waiting for the birth of a wondrous child, for the sun to return, I try to remember how am I nourished by the waiting itself, by the time of the dark? How are we saved by mushrooms, saved by that which grows in the dark, needs protection from the harsh light of day? The indigenous traditions of Latvia and Lithuania speak of the sun goddess Sole. In some ancient mythologies, Soleil rides across the sky in a chariot pulled by reindeer. And at the winter solstice, as her return is celebrated, she carries a cup, a golden chalice forged by the smith god Calvis. And the chalice, this golden chalice she holds, catches her tears, which are made of amber. And as she flies across the sky, she scatters these drops of sunlight, seeds for the next year's harvest, golden apples, the sweetness of life, crystallized sunlight scattered in the dark of winter, amber tears. I don't really fully understand how amber comes to be. Here's my best understanding. Ancient trees, we're talking millions of years ago, sunlight comes in and they take it from their branches and turn it in, distill it into sap. And some of that sap is turned into resin, the liquid content evaporated away and some resin found itself in just the right conditions to undergo molecular polymerization. 
that I'm not even going to try to explain, but, but those right conditions, those right conditions for the sunlight turned sap turned resin, this distilled and hardened sunlight. Pressure, the right heat and darkness. Exposure to sunlight disintegrates the resin. So amber tears, feelings given form in the long dark stillness, eventually become the scattered gifts of light, the sweet apple, the precious droplets of frozen sun. With all the blessings of the light and all the celebration of the light, especially in our culture and especially with all of our electrical lights always available, always surrounding us, it is easy to forget the grave importance of the dark. And you know, one of the ways I think that shows up, I have a great deal of training in how to talk things out naming the feelings and needs and speaking about the dynamics at play in a group or a relationship or a decision. But sometimes I realize I put too much faith in talking things out. Too much faith in that impulse towards transparency and, and speaking of what's going on. Sometimes it's important to honor things left unsaid. You know about things left unsaid, not in the painful, poisonous way, but in the respectful, honoring way. Sometimes as benign as, you know, how you really feel about that jacket or those earrings. Or sometimes the small irritations and grievances that you chalk up to ignorance or rush, ones that are forgotten and forgiven without any conversation or process. And then there are the things that you just know about each other, especially in close relationships, close community over many years, things that perhaps you've talked about before, but now leave unsaid with a silent mutual acknowledgement that there just isn't anything to say about it right now. Then there are all the things we're so tempted to say, but which we know in our heart of hearts will not do anyone any good. One of the admonishments of the spirit I hold is to speak truth with love. You might have heard me talk about this, to speak truth with love. I felt the temptation, and my guess is you have too, in an effort to make someone feel good or smooth things over, to speak loving words that are not true. It'll all be okay. Those earrings are beautiful on you. Or how about you? you're probably right, let's just move on. And I know also the temptation to speak the truth, even though I can't muster any love to accompany it. I've learned slower than my mom would probably like to stop reminding her every time we've already had this or that conversation. It's true but offering another reminder that her memory is not what it once was, is a barb between us, truth, but without kindness, without love. Every one of us, every one of us knows the power of, of unkind words. Every heart, every heart here has been torn and ripped by words spoken without love. And the more truth they have, in fact, the more power they have to hurt. And we know too that sometimes we will be unable to find the love to accompany our truth. Sometimes this high bar will be unattainable and, and I think that's okay. Sometimes a moment of silence is the best path forward. The most truth with love we can offer. Makes me think of that old adage, even though it might sound trite, the one I first learned from Thumper, Thumper the rabbit in the movie Bambi. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. But what to do, what to do with these 
things left unsaid. As the world turns, as our lives transform, even as we're held in a kind of stasis and stillness, all that is too tender yet for words, what to do with things left unsaid. I suggest that like the sower, we scatter them in the soil of the heart. Like Sole's tears, give them time, more time than you think is needed, sheltered from the harsh light of day. Give them the conditions they need to become precious golden drops of amber. Let time and spirit do their work. Let what is important and necessary in those unsaid seeds rest in the beautiful dark of the soil. The harsh truths will decompose, be eaten by birds or choked by thorns. What is important will receive water and sun, be nurtured and transformed, find its way to the surface or through dark and pressure become crystal, clear, frozen sunlight. May we give space for those unsaid seeds to grow, grow roots and emerge anew. Let them ripen until they're ready to be spoken. Trust their season will come. And one more story. This is from the Buddhist teacher Tara Brock. She talks about a woman who was spending the evening with her mother. And her mother told this woman that she had breast cancer. And the woman described how intense her initial shock was. She went into panic planning mode. What needs to happen? What are the treatment options? How soon do we get the lump removed? Rather than finding a moment of pause, Tara Brock talks about a moment of pause, a moment of stillness, of silence. She was going into control mode. The woman said, in that moment, I was able to do something I would have missed otherwise. I was able to do something I would have missed otherwise. My mother, she didn't want to talk about any of these things. As I was weighing her options, whether it was a biopsy, a mastectomy, et cetera, she, she sat on the high top chair in my kitchen, staring blankly into a cup of coffee. She says, I was trying to be strong for her sake and mine, but it suddenly became clear that wasn't what she needed. She was scared and needed to be scared. Staying busy was my way of avoiding a total collapse, but being present, pausing and being present allowed me to shift to her way. I took a breath walked across the room and wrapped my arms around her. It was an awkward sideways hug, but it was also a long necessary one. And in this stillness, in this pause, in this breath, something happened. Slowly, her mom started rocking from side to side like a mother rocks a child, except the child was now the caretaker. She says it was a sweet, tiny moment I'll never forget. One that I surely would have missed were it not for the power of mindfulness. And Tara Brock teaches the blessing of a pause the shift from being in the grip of the controlling self, that more familiar identity to that pause, that opening to inhabit a loving presence, to enter into the dark, to listen with a sensitivity that can respond with a greater wisdom. It is the tradition for many on solstice to burn 
that which is not serving us any longer, to let go of the old, to burn that which prevents us from dwelling as we need in the dark. What needs to be burned in the fire for you this year? In a moment, I'll invite you, if you have a piece of paper nearby, to jot it down or simply to contemplate it as we sing one more song. What needs to be buried in the earth, left behind in the stillness of the year passing? What needs to be left for time and spirit to do their work? That you may enter that stillness, that we may walk each other home. What in the stillness of the longest night would you turn over to the mysterious forces of season and cycle? Let go of trying to figure out, to fix, to control. What would you give over to a trust in the greater rhythms at work? What would you leave behind in this pandemic time of stillness? As we begin to prepare for so much to come back for a reintegration into one another's lives, what of the old ways would you leave behind? As we listen or hear you sing this song, may your life be as a song. I invite you to name for yourself that which you would hold in the dark, turn over to the fire. May it be so. Amen. May your life be as a song, resounding with the dawn, to sing awake the night, and softly serenade the stars, ever dancing circles in the night. May your life be as a song, resounding May with the dawn, be to sing awake the song. night, and sounding with the dawn, to sing awake the night, and sounding with the dawn, to sing awake the night, and sounding with the dawn, to sing awake the night. And sounding with the dawn to sing awake the night. And sounding with the dawn to sing awake the night. And sounding with the dawn to sing awake the night. And softly sounds in the night. The stars ever dancing circles in the night.